I am Brad Keeler. He is Mark Wayne. Next up on Director's Cut, hear a great story about geo legend Bob Kerner and coffee. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Director's Cut. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute, and that is why we call this show Director's Cut. Every single week, until I get fired, except at summer and one week during the holidays, I interview a different GI member who has lots, lots, lots of stories to tell. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, one, we should really talk. But after this interview, you should head over to geoinstitute.org. While you are there, among many other things, you will find out that we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and that we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. If you like what you see today, and I think you will, you should click like, subscribe, get notifications, and if you do those things, we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. We are on episode 101 of Director's Cut this week. After last week's great 100th episode with Geo Legend Jim Mitchell, we have to follow it up with somebody. And so we got on the phone and we found this guy here, Mark Wayne, who's director of application technology and engineering see how i read it so i wouldn't mess it up from tensar he is based in atlanta georgia or its suburbs i'm not really sure he'll clear that up for us in a minute mark thank you for joining us thanks brad we have 10 questions the same as we do every week on director's cut and two of them are the same we start with one of those describe your job in 45 seconds yeah, so here at Tensar, one of the main things that we do is manufacture material referred to as a geogrid, part of the family of geosynthetics. So one can imagine that that material needs to be investigated in the field uh, or in a laboratory setting. And so part of my uh, job is to make sure as a program manager that all that research um, has clear objectives and we work with uh, outstanding uh, universities and third party facilities around the world. And so we make sure that we give them all the information they need to um, do the experimental design, and then we can look at the performance of these materials. So um, in that regard, I'm traveling all around the world to investigate um, how researchers are looking at geosynthetics. And, and in particular, uh, right now, the focus for me has been on transportation and uh, infrastructure. So roads, um, how we get to build those roads using platforms and, and et cetera. Um, and then I'm also in charge of a group of engineers that uh, do designs and they're designing walls and slopes and roads and uh, airfields and all sorts of wonderful things uh, that we as civil engineers, I think, take for granted quite a bit. But there's a lot of engineering that goes into that. So uh, that's how I spend my time. So I've always felt like you were relatively unique, certainly among our membership and probably in the profession, that sometimes there's sort of a wide gulf between academics and practice, and you're straddling that gulf. What pressures do you ever feel because of that? Do you feel like anybody's pulling you from either side? Or, I mean, it, it definitely makes for a unique job, I would think. Yeah, so... Well, yeah, you you have the aspect of making sure that the engineering gets done. But the more exciting part, I, I think, for me as, a, as an engineer is working with the universities and the third party uh, uh, facilities because um, they, they're stuck in some regard. They're stuck in their own little bubble as to what they do. And when I come in, sometimes I come in with some unique perspective and they're like, well, where did that come from? Well, you know, I picked that up over at the University of Illinois or where did that come? Well, I was just down at the University of Texas. Or, or, or what about that concept? Well, they're working on that at Georgia Tech. You see what I'm saying? So, so the, the beautiful thing for me is that I get to speak to a lot of people doing uh, perhaps very specific research that doesn't, it's kind of being curated and it doesn't have a chance to see 
the, the light of day, right? People write papers, they do the research. So the exciting thing for me is, um, I guess I'm like the engineering bee that goes from 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 plant to plant, and then it, it gives these people ideas. Like, no, I, you know, I didn't think of it from that perspective. So for me, that's exciting. And then taking that information and seeing how we can adjust engineering to make things more effective, right? So it's sort of like that cycle that we like to create. Like, you know, okay, we do it this way, but wait a minute, there's a tweak here we learned. Let's adjust it, and you know, let's make this uh, a process that we can keep innovating as we go along so that's that's what's exciting i really like that b analogy you may have earned yourself a day in a costume or at least in yellow and black when we're out in uh, los angeles for geo congress <laughs> we we have to ask fun questions too while we're on director's cut although you know i say that word and this question is not a super fun question what's the most physical pain you've ever felt oh yeah so Interesting you would ask that question because I was just uh, somewhere and I was explaining what happened to me because I met a fellow pole vaulter and it, ha and it happened to be a woman engineer who was also a pole vaulter and I was like fascinated. I'm like, oh, you pole vaulter too. And I said, the most interesting story I had is in high school, the poles were not composite poles. They, they were very unforgiving. So it was almost like if you imagine grabbing onto a two by four jamming it in the ground and going vertically. They actually, the, my nickname was Mark Twain because I looked like I was hanging up in the air on a two by four. At any rate, so um, at that time I was getting, I, I, I ran down the runway and apparently I didn't know this at the time, but there were a bunch of people on the other side of the track getting ready to start their race. Because as you know, in track and field, things are going on at the same yep. time. So I go up and I, I'm like, oh, I cleared it. You know, I cleared it. And as I was turning around, I was off balance and I came down and I came down and I popped my ankle out. And it, when my ankle popped out, it started to race on the other side of the field <laughs> because it was that loud. The only other thing I remember is standing up and then I was in the hospital. So it was so painful that when they got me up to walk me, you know, I just tried to put the weight on it and I just passed out. Next thing I know, I'm in the hospital and all I hear is hurry up. He's waking up, pull it back. And they were pulling it back into places of waking up. And then I went out again. But that was my most uh, painful experience, as you would say. So wow. pole vaulting is, uh, you know, can be dangerous. I can only imagine. Now, as a parent of a track kid, he's a runner. He's not a pole vaulter. I watched the field kids, especially the pole vaulters, and I see how they got into it. And it was all kind of by accident, it seems like. How did you start pole vaulting? Um, I enjoyed high jumping. And so somebody said, well, if you can go over the bar like that, then you should try the pole vaulting. You got to go up and go over the bar. So uh, yeah, I, I did that. I did hurdling, which is another thing. If you do hurdles, if you do all these tasks where you're jumping over stuff, and <laughs> somebody says, well, the natural thing you should go to next is, hey, go higher and, and do, you know, pole vaulting. So it was fun. Oh, that is fantastic. And I feel like people, we could end this now and people have already learned so much about you. <laughs> but that's the magic of Director's Cut. We have eight more questions. Yep. We have to ask a little bit. Uh, this is always the research or technical question, the third one. We talked a little bit before we started recording here. One of the research testing things that is near and dear to my heart is pavement testing. I love it. My favorite R&D facility in the United States of America might be the pavement uh, lab at the FAA R&D facility in Atlantic City. You have spent a lot of time at the uh, Accelerated Pavement Testing Research Facility at the Army Corps of Engineers ERDC in Vicksburg. That's right. You did a field trips episode about it earlier this year, which we'll link to down in the show notes. That's called cross promotion, all you marketers out there. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about the research that you guys have done down there? Yeah, so um, in that field trip, I talked about the instrumentation that we were putting in place, um, which is very exciting. And that's that had the and you can see that in the cross promotion uh, link. So I won't have to go into that. Um, so we're at the point now where we're close to 900,000 easels of trafficking of the first two uh, sections. So to put that in terms, a lot of people don't know what that means. But in terms of highway work, um, 
if you imagine in a car, you would say, if I'm driving my car, what does that represent in terms of easels influencing on the road? And you would need to have a 5,000. You'd need to drive across an area 5,000 times, roughly, uh, to give yourself a, a, an easel, right? So an easel is just a way that we try to equate a loading uh, on a pavement system. Um, so what we're in essence trying to do is accelerate the process by having a wheel go back and forth continually over those sections. And obviously, since we're dealing with asphalt, which has um, uh, temperature comes into play, you want to eliminate the variables. So we control the temperature of the environment above the uh, asphalt and then we just traffic that and we also traffic it to include some wander in there so because you never usually you're never driving in the same spot every time um, and then what we do is compare that to whether we have a geo grid in place or we don't have a geo grid and what we're trying to do is from these studies that forms an essential part with the instrumentation that we included uh, to get us to understanding more about um, not only its empirical behavior from the study but also the mechanistic aspect, which is the latest thing that we're doing with pavement design, since you were interested, you know, mechanistic empirical uh, design is something that's very important today in pavements. So is that all clear? Yeah, that's fantastic. But I do have a follow-up question. I mean, when you go into, I, I know pavements are near and dear to your heart too. When you go into a pavements lab, what is the first thing you look for or the thing that just speaks to you more than going anywhere else? Well, I'd like to see how well the, the, the facilities are uh, controlled as far as the environment um, and actually see what sort of big and neat new equipment that they have. You know what I mean? Like how big is this equipment? Like you said, if you go to the FAA facility, you'll see some of the largest uh, pieces of equipment simulating actual plane loading, yeah. right? So what we're doing at the military facility, they can simulate also rail loading now with the new equipment. Oh. And, and they're simulating, and they simulate a lot of uh, loading from all the different planes, right? They, they even do testing uh, on mat systems that they put on soft soils. They do uh, testing over top of culverts. They do all sorts of testing and new materials, you know? Um, so I like to look at the, the, the accelerated pavement testing, the actual equipment itself um, to see what they have. Because I've seen various stages of development in this industry and it's really impressive where we're heading um, to, to actually model these things in full scale. It's very exciting. A good little commercial there for ERDC. Shout out Dave Pittman. I don't know if he watches any of these, but uh, I mean, maybe Tingle. I'll have to send him an email and get him to. <laughs> the shout out would be Jeb Tingle. And, um, you know, there's uh, Jeremy, Dr. Jeremy Robinson who's doing our work. So, yes. So you, we're going to talk about this a little more in detail later on. You've been on the 2023 Geo Congress Program Committee. I've had to Google you several times, I guess, in the past couple of years just to find out some information about you. Uh, and we just passed Election Day. I hope everybody's candidate won. These things are all coming together in this way. There is, in the state of Oklahoma, a senator-elect who was member of Congress for the past several, several years named Mark Wayne Mullen. Every time I Google you, I get search results for Mark Wayne Mullen. How frustrating is it to share a name with senator-elect Mark Wayne Mullen? <laughs> yeah, I, so um, I actually I had to Google him myself because <laughs> you sent that question, which which is, is true. So yeah, I, I don't know much about him and and um i think the more interesting thing is you would say i, I travel all over the world and when i check into hotels that's usually not the, the first thing that people say batman they always equate me to batman for some reason i don't know i'm not wearing a cape but I, uh, so it is kind of interesting you said that so so far to date that that really hasn't come up and uh it, it is interesting you do say that because he puts mark wayne together in his name right so yes it, he does yeah. well or somebody did it for him and he just went along with it oh. that could be <laughs> but you mentioned also before we started recording that it's you kind of have an interesting case where you have you know the the rare two first names as your name in the middle henry so three first names even how how has that affected you yeah that um because then people get confused. So a lot of times people will call me Wayne instead of Mark. So I, I get that. 
So that, that, that's where it gets confusing. So it, it is kind of funny. I don't think my parents thought about that when they <laughs> put that all together, but uh, certainly has been something for me. But it's also very succinct. I think one of the things that came up, it was during one of the Chris Avergas's interviews that if they had ever been a pro athlete, it would have been, they would have had one of the arched names on the back. You had a, you have a great pro athlete name. You should have gone farther with the pole vaulting maybe. Yeah, that would have been good. <laughs> if I could go on that to, to the height that they're going today, that's for sure. We're just hitting all the fun questions here yep. up front today. I feel like, what is the most memorable meal you have eaten in your life? Yeah, so th this is a, interesting. I had to think about this a little more, but then it came to me. So back in 2012, um, you know, as you're getting older, it seems like your your body's going in all the wrong directions, right? It's going out in every direction, and I found that I I, I found that a plant based diet is something I should look into, right? So I got into it and my wife started to get into it a little bit. And then one time we said, hey, as a family, let's go to a place that offers a little of everything. And my son decided, yeah, maybe I, I think I can do that. And uh, he wasn't aware, you know, like plant-based diet means that they're going to cut these large pieces of squash and zucchini and you're going to slice those up in pieces and you'll be eating that. <laughs> And so it was memorable because he didn't really put it all together until, but now he's, he's a vegan. So he, he, he really has mastered that uh, better than, than myself. As I travel, I find I may have to have some fish every now and then, but for the most part, I eat a plant-based diet. And so that, that was the first, I could say, memorable meal where the family uh, kind of moved in one direction, so to speak, toward more of a plant-based diet. And, and, you know, every now and then, um, you know, having some fish or something like that. But for the so I think one thing that people probably always follow that up with, don't you miss meat? And he, yeah. that, so I'm not going to ask that question, but I'm going to say, what is, what was the most challenging part about it for you? Not necessarily what you missed the most, but what was the hardest adjustment when you moved over to that diet? I think just when you, um, when you go into restaurants or when you go into the grocery store, you know, the smells, um, are something that you long for, right? I mean, you're used to those things. I mean, if somebody's cooking pizza, well, you know, almost every store you go into now, they're cooking something. So in the beginning, it was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta stay over here in a produce section and not linger too far <laughs> in any other direction. So yeah, it was a little bit distracting, but I, I think the interesting thing today is there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of recipes now that you can make things that have the taste that are similar to the taste that you would normally get if you were eating meat, if I, if that makes sense, meat or dairy, cause I don't, I don't uh, eat dairy either. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's um, not like it was, I could say back in 2012 as a starting point of having all these things. Um, like now you can get just egg, which is, you know, mung bean, you know, that people eat as egg and some people you'll make this food and they're like, it, you test them, like test it. And they, they would, they wouldn't know really. It would taste like an omelet to them if you made it. So it really is incredible. I mean, I'm 43. I'm not that old. And I can remember going into health food stores in the 80s and it was like a different planet. And now most of the stuff that was available in those stores, you can walk into any, even a small grocery store and pick up all the different varieties of it, you know, whatever it is. And it's a, it's a good time to be alive, I think. Oh, yeah, for sure. So the other question we ask everybody who comes on Director's Cut is how did you first get involved in ASCE and GI? Yeah, so um, that's an interesting question because um, back in the day, remember I had Dr. Kerner. I think he was the first influence on uh, basically telling his students that, now this wasn't GI at the time, back then it was just ASCE. So he was a strong advocate for being involved with not just ASCE, with ASCE, it was concrete canoe. That was a big thing for us. But um, also it was ASTM for standards, because he believed that obviously with geosynthetics, we need to be in standards. So yeah, initially ASCE, my first, um, you know, really getting involved with ASCE was, hey, go build that concrete canoe. And, uh, you know, becoming part of, of, the, of that community. So that's where you get the whole community together, right? And you're building that now. But now ASC has things, we're building bridges, we're building actually geosynthetic structures, right? 
And um, so I think that uh, community of people getting together to try to figure out, hey, let's let's put this big chunk of concrete together so we can float in the water. That's <laughs> that's something we should be doing, you know, multiple weekends in a row trying to build this thing. So that that was ASCE. And then G, as far as GI goes, I remember um, really Dr. Jim Collin. Um, many people know that name. He's 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 been involved with uh, a lot of different positions throughout ASCE. I don't need to go through all those, but um, I had um, left the industry for a little bit to uh, found a company with my wife and she still runs that company, but I'm back in the industry where I'm actually getting out to events. And um, I ended up going to, and this leads into Geo Congress. I went to a Geo Congress in Atlanta and Jim said, hey, you haven't been here for a while. You need to get back into it and really get sink your teeth into becoming part, in other words, contributing. It's one thing just to sit in a meeting. Right. I mean, we can all just sit in a meeting, but um, kind of get your teeth in and be part of a GI, uh, geosynthetics, because this is something you enjoy and I don't see why you shouldn't get more involved. And that's where I started to get involved. And today um, I'm the chair of the ASCE um, uh, geosynthetics, GI geosynthetics. Um, and I, I enjoy that, you know, and, and, and starting to get uh, more people to be interested in geosynthetics and get them on the committee and and really expanding uh, you know our influence on civil engineering. So you hit a few things in that answer that we're going to talk more about later, including what we teased up front, Bob Kerner. Before we get to that, I mentioned earlier, and you talked about how you kind of straddle the research to practice gap there. And so I wanted to be sure to ask you this question. And I picked 30 years just arbitrarily because it's far enough out that things could reasonably change by then, I guess. So in the next 30 years, what do you, what technology do you think is going to be the most transformational to civil or geotechnical engineering? <clears throat> So this is this also you did a tease on Bob, but here's another Bob item. Bob Kerner, if anybody knows him and knows he put in, he would show a thousand slides for one class. And the slide that that brought memories to most people, and you can Google it on the internet and find it. There's a gentleman whose head is in the ground, and <laughs> Bob would always say, if we could only understand what's going on in the ground, we'd have a better idea on how to design it. So as far as what's going to be the most influential thing that I can see in geosynthetics is we are now starting to make instrumentation uh, more durable, more robust, that we can get those instruments in the ground and get more information than we have right now. Who wouldn't love, for example, up in the north, right, where we have roads where they say, hey, spring thaw, you can't drive on those. So if you could have instruments in there that change that dynamic instead of a fixed date, like, oh, you know, on this date, we have to stop trucks and then we start them on this date. No, why should it be that? It could be from having the technology, would, we would know, hey, no, we need to stop now. Once things, once we understand what's going on underneath the road, then we can start up again. That's gonna, I, and that's just one example. That's one of many, but I think, I think most people that are watching this right now will agree that our ability to put instruments in the ground and in structures and everywhere else is going to be the impetus to make a lot of changes. Not a, so all the people that do the modeling, right? Now to actually have actual feedback to put in our models to make the things we do more efficient um, and more sustainable, right? But from this, we can find out what things we can reuse um, based on where they are in their life, right? If we can better monitor these materials, we'll know how much life they have left in them. And, and I think that's part of sustainability. But so over this time, I think instruments are only going to get better and we're going to find uh, better, uh, more unique ways to instrument and uh, use that data for engineering. So I think we're going to set a record today for Bob Kerner mentions. I'm not sure that we've ever cleared more than a couple in one interview, but we're definitely going to do it now because he just came up again. Yeah. Every single person. I. Everybody who watches the show will know I try not to ever repeat questions. There are only a couple that get repeated. And one of them is whenever anybody comes on who's from the Philadelphia area, but especially somebody with ties to Drexel, I have to ask them, do you have a favorite Bob Kerner story? And yes, I definitely do. Um, you know, Bob, came, 
this is going to add on to the story a little bit, but Bob came to me. I was we had a basement at Drexel where a lot of students would hang out, and that same basement housed the poor students that had to use COBOL and Fortran. <laughs> And, you know, with the, the poor business guys with all the cards, you could just imagine them running around. So I'm sitting there and Kerner came to me and he introduced me to geosynthetics. He said, here's a here's the um, a draft issue of the designing with geosynthetics, not published yet. He said, don't mind all the red marks in there. Just go through there this weekend and I need you on Monday to tell me if you want to work in this field. So I read that and I was like, oh, my God, I have to do this. But in that same location that we talked at one point, um, we were getting coffee because he loved his coffee. And at that point, they had, Drexel had just installed these machines not too long ago where you, you have the dried coffee that you could actually just put your cup in and have yourself a cup of coffee. That was new back then. I don't want, now I'm aging myself, but that was new. That was a new technology. And I, and I was complaining to Bob. I said, you know, but every now and then this thing's out of coffee. And he's like, well, I fixed the first part of that problem. I'm like, well, what does that mean? He said, well, it used to be far worse than what, you're, what you have now. Now, he said, I can assure you, it's out of coffee. I said, well, what happened before? He said, Tersagi's Tursa arching problem happened before. I mean, you know, they put this coffee, they poorly designed this coffee machine. I said, well, what did you do? He said, I called the coffee manufacturer, of course, and fixed it. I said, well, do you have a patent on that? He's like, no, I just needed my coffee. <laughs> and that was just how Bob was. If he had to fix something, he would go about figuring out how to get it fixed and just get it done. So that's another, a couple of Bob uh, stories that I liked. That's good. I mean, the first one, it sounds like it paid off. You took that weekend. Did it even take you the full weekend for you to decide this is what you wanted to do? Yeah, I think th by the end of Saturday, after I got through most of it, I said, this is, this is probably the first guy that read about putting steel in concrete. It's the same sort of thing, right? You see all these, like, man, there's unlimited opportunities for this stuff. So, well, that's yeah, fantastic. That's and that is why we ask that question to everybody who had Bob Kerner connections. Yep. So you mentioned Jim Collin earlier, too, and how he got you to come back to GI and to the Geo Congress in Atlanta. I, You've lived in Atlanta now for several years. I, I mean, I'm going to ask what was most memorable about the 2014 Geo Congress in Atlanta, but also what's it like having Geo Congress in your hometown? Yeah, so, well, so the, I guess since I'm so used to flying somewhere else or going somewhere else, maybe the only thing for me that was a little different is, oh, wow, now I got to go down to this conference, <laughs> spend all day and make my way through traffic. And go home every night. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that was the only, the, the, that was the only uh, downside for me, but, um, I, I thought it was great because from my perspective, it was an opportunity for me to introduce people that weren't from Atlanta, um, things to do. Because, you know, I think a lot of times we go, I, I even get that. Somebody said to me the other day, he said, when you, you travel all over, do you get to see anything? I said, yes, I kind of try to make a point of trying to see something. Yeah. And that's, that's where ASCE, I think, uh, is so great when ASCE has their tours and things that can be done, um, you know, while, while you're, you know, at the conference um, and relying on the local people to really uh, give you an idea of what they can do or just help out. Right. You're, you know, it'd be interesting that now that you bring this up, it would be nice uh, on our badges that I'm a local or something, <laughs> uh, you know, ask me a question. Um, that may be another thing we could add to ASCE because, you know, when you're from out of town, Sometimes you do have those questions like, hey, I have a free afternoon. What should I go do? You know, and I'm sure a local to the area would uh, be more than happy to say, oh, I really think you should go see this or, you know, so and so. I just found out so and so's in town. Maybe you want to do that. But at any rate, I'm sure we have ambassadors um, for ASC. I'm just I may not be aware of it, but we'd um, we'd have to go even bigger for GI. We'd give people like neon hats or something <laughs> like that. We we don't want you to be able to hide. <laughs> but I, but I, like I said, I'm not aware if we've done that. But I think when I remember people coming to Atlanta, I I spent some time with people. In fact, I even took people to restaurants, for example, that I knew were really, you know, nice places to go to. Um, so I I think that's a you know a plus for people that are in the area where ASCE is having uh, the conference. 
we're going to seamlessly transition to a question about the next Geo Congress. Yep. You are on our program committee for Geo Congress 2023, which will be, of course, March 26th to 29th in Los Angeles. We hope to see all of you viewers there. You've been one of our proceedings editors this time. What are you most looking forward to about Geo Congress 2023? Yeah, I'm I'm excited to to get to the West Coast. I'm excited about getting together with uh, a large number of people that have been actually on TV most of the time, right? Because of COVID. I mean, I, I think yeah. I'm very excited that more people are getting out. And I really think that this come spring, I think we're going to have a lot of people there that I have not seen for a number of years. And that's going to be exciting. And if we if we add in, like you said, the, the bright hat that says, I'm a, you know, I'm a local, <laughs> ask me if, if you have a question, ask me. Maybe that'll even make it uh, even better. But no, I'm very excited about the venue. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, seeing people that I haven't seen for a long time. And in we person, are in person, that is. Absolutely. And we are going to do our best to make it a great one. We've had a fantastic committee this time. All the papers are turned over to ASCE publications to get turned into those magic proceedings. Now we start the work of putting together the sessions and really putting the final details on the conference. And so again, viewers, I hope we see every last one of you there. Mark, you made it through all 10 questions. You did it without really any near disasters or anything. No pole vaulting disasters. That yeah. that that's gonna stick with me for a while. I I did not even hear the noise, and yet I'm going to remember that. And every time I'm at a track meet and I see a kid do the pole vault, I'm gonna think of that. But again, you made it through all 10 questions for our viewers. If you liked what you saw today, and I usually say you're here at the end, so you probably did. Again, click like, subscribe, get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. So, Mark, thanks a lot. Thanks for your thoughtful answers and for doing this. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, hopefully convince people to come out to the conference because I'm excited. I think it will, and I don't even think it's that tough of a sell, but we'll see them there. And for all you Director's Cut viewers, we will see you with our very special Thanksgiving episode next week.